The story so far. I am attempting to port the Fusix operating system to the ESP8266. I have got the kernel up and running up to the point where it fails because it can't mount the file system. I spent the last session trying to get the ESP8266 board talking to a SD card, because I want to use the SD card for storage, and failed miserably. Something is going on which I don't really understand. I am trying to get assistance on that. But in the meantime, I cannot proceed until I have a root file system of some description. So let's see if we can make the internal flash on the board act as our file system. Now, this is actually rather more interesting, by which I mean complicated, than it seems. The internal flash of the board is actually a raw flash device, and raw flash devices are awkward to deal with. Uh, normally, this is all hidden from you by a microcontroller that lives inside a USB stick or SD card or similar, but we don't have one, so I'm going to have to do it manually. So, let me first explain how Flash works. So let's make a notes document. Um, normally, you have uh, a set of physical blocks that live on a storage device. If you want to access data in block two, you go look at block two of the device. Very simple. Flash is similar, however, it's limited while you can change one bit to zero anytime you like, you cannot change zero bits to one. Instead, you have to erase uh, multiple blocks at the same time. Uh, so let's put block number down the side. Uh, on this device, each block is uh, 4K. So let's say this contains like so. Reading is easy. If we want to read sector F, we simply divide the sector number by four, determine that it is in uh, block one, and read accordingly. But say we want to write. Well, the only way of doing that it's a simple way, is to copy the entire contents of a block into temp storage. Then we erase the entire block, and then we copy from the temp storage back into flash with the modified data. This isn't so great for two reasons. One, we have to be able to store an entire block in memory. Uh, on this device, a block is 4K, and uh, we don't really have that much spare RAM. But the other and more serious reason is that each block can be erased a certain number of times, typically about 10,000. So by writing that block, we've reduced the lifespan of that block by one. And say we want to write uh, again to the same uh, sector. Now we've reduced it again. And the thing about file systems is that th things like the directories get written to a lot. So just naively slapping a simple file system down onto the raw flash is both awkward because we need to, lots of temporary storage in RAM and also is guaranteed to kill the flash very quickly. So what we do instead is we implement a where leveling system so that each time you write to the flash it actually goes to a different physical location. So rather than writing again and again and again to the same block we end up writing four times to four different blocks. 
which means we d uh, we have only used up one available erasure of uh, across the board. And the normal way of doing this is you uh, have a lookup table between uh, the logical sector which in this case are letters and the physical block where it lives so that we can say that ABCD lives in 0, 0 EFGH lives in 01 uh, IJKL lives in 02 MNOP lives in 03 and I'm actually going to add a fourth one which is empty. So one potential strategy for doing this is say we want to write, we want to replace sector F with the value X. Well, uh, we write the updated, let me do that properly, the updated data to uh, block four, uh, we uh, update our mapping and we erase the old block so that we can write something else to it. This works fine. Uh, so the next time we want to write, say we want to update MNOP, we write it to our spare, our empty block. We erase that and we update our mapping. The problem here is that we cannot make sense of the contents of the flash without the mapping table. Therefore, we have to store the mapping table somewhere in the flash. And, of course, we can just store it in one of the blocks. We can have a directory block called, like, you know, FF, which contains the mapping. But this means that every time we change the mapping, we have to update block FF. And, of course, that will use up the... Uh, the lifespan of that block rapidly. So there's two ways to do this. Either the mapping table can move throughout the flash so that uh, we never keep writing to the same block or we can spread it out throughout the uh, entire flash and that is the one we're going to be using. So let me come up with a slightly more com concrete example. Uh, our sectors uh, in physics terms are 512 bytes, which means that we get uh, eight sectors per flash block. So, I'm trying to come up with a decent way to represent this. So, D, E, F, G, H. K-L-M-N-O-P and we're going to leave the last one blank. We are going to be reserving one of these sectors for the actual metadata. So uh, we can just eliminate the left-hand column entirely. This means that we're actually st only storing seven uh, sectors worth of data per block. Uh, as we only need about a few bytes of metadata per block, this is actually wasting a uh, it's wasting an eighth of the storage space. But that's fine. We have lots of flash. STU. Uh, and actually, let's just put the left-hand column here. 512 bytes for the metadata. The metadata describes uh, the logical block that is in this physical block. And in fact, we can do that like this. So, so what this is doing is saying that physical block zero contains logical block 0. Physical block 1 contains logical block 1, etc. Uh, physical block 3 is blank. So, 
let's say we want to update a value in of logical block zero. We look up our mapping, uh, we copy the entire block with our updated data into an empty block. We uh, update the logical block of this the the new uh, the new location of block zero, and we mark this block as being obsolete. In fact, sorry, no, we don't. We don't mark it as being obsolete, we erase it. So the next time we want to update something, like say uh, we want to update logical block one, we copy it into the empty block. We update the mapping and we erase the old block. Uh, we can, you see, copy from one block to another without needing a complete temporary buffer. We basically just have to load a byte at a time. We're going to do it 512 bytes at a time for because we will need a buffer that big, but this is much cheaper. Now, there is still a problem here. Let's say we update uh, logical block one again. So that goes into our old block, we update the mapping, we erase the old one, and now we update it again. We copy it into the spare, we erase the old one, we update it again. You see that it is, in fact, alternating between the same two physical blocks. Uh, if you keep writing to the same sector of the file system, then it will, uh, it will not distribute the wear across the entire flash system. It will concentrate it in these two physical blocks and kill them off very quickly. So in fact, we are going to have to use a rather different approach. Let me just reset the state. Uh, H I J K L M N O yeah. N O P Q R S T and the last one is empty. Right, the way we're going to do this is we keep a pointer, the, uh, the round robin pointer to a block. You're going to start it at 1 for reasons. Now, we want to write the logical block 0. The first thing we do is we evict the contents of the round robin block. We just copy that into the spare. We erase the old one. We then copy uh, our updated data into it, erase the old, and advance the round robin pointer. So we have in fact done two erasers here. We wish to uh, update this again, so we do exactly the same thing. We copy the uh, the block pointed to by the round robin pointer to our empty slot. We erase the old one. We then copy our new data, erase the old location, and advance the round robin pointer. So you can see how this is going. Uh, it ensures that every time we write a block, uh, it will go into uh, the next block 
along, we will end up cycling through the entire Flash file system. The, uh, the, empty, uh, the empty spare will move randomly around depending where the last block that we updated was, but the data will always be written to the contents of the, uh, the round robin block. This, unfortunately, it does involve two erasers per write, but it will allow us to cycle through the entire flash. Uh, this will distribute the load across the entire device. So let's do a few calculations to actually figure out how long this is going to last. Now, say that we are doing one write per second this means that we're doing two erasers per second. We know that because of the way things work, uh, the erasers will be distributed evenly. Now I have a eight megabyte flash device. Uh, it turns out that, uh, let me just rerun the burn. Uh, no, sorry, I have a four megabyte flash device. I'm sure it said eight the last time I looked. I wonder if that might be unreliable. Okay, I have a four megabyte flash device of which we are using one megabyte for our code. So that is actually going to be three megabytes worth of physical blocks. Uh, each physical block is 4K, so that gives us Uh, <laughs> that gives us 768 physical blocks. Each physical block can actually store seven sectors worth of data because of the overhead in the logical block number, which is, that means that we can actually store Uh, two and a half megabytes, more or less, which for this system is absolutely fine. We can put a decent root file system on that. Now, 768 physical blocks at two erasers per second means it's going to take 384 seconds to erase every block. Uh, this flash device it can cope with about 10,000 erasers. So the total lifespan of the system is going to be three by uh, 384 by 10,000, which is, that's in seconds, which is 64,000 minutes, 2,700-ish hours, uh, days, hang on, uh, that number of seconds, that many minutes, I need to divide by 60 again, that many hours, that many days, at one right per second, and then we will run out of uh, flash lifespan and it will fail. Unfortunately, this means we need a new device because the flash is not replaceable. But that's at one write per second. We're actually going to be doing far fewer than that. How many writes per second do we need to last a year? Well, uh, the total number of writes we can support are, well, that number. So that many seconds in a year divided by the number of total writes is eight, uh, one write every eight seconds. 
Now, we are probably not going to achieve anything like that. Uh, hmm. Okay, if I sound surprised, it's because I did do this calculation ahead of time and got a different number. I think I may have forgotten to divide by 60 again that time. Uh, let me double check things. 768 physical blocks. Uh, two writes per every update is 384. Uh, 10,000 writes per block means yep that seems like that seems like the total number of writes we can make we're very unlikely to write eight times a second but it it is going to be extremely bursty if you copy to a file then it will write multiple sectors one after another it is possible to optimize things by detecting that certain sectors do not contain data. So that, for example, if this was like so, but we know that D, E, F, and G are empty, then if you write to this sector, we can just write it. We don't need to fiddle about with the mapping. Uh, however, in order to do that, we need information about which sectors of the file system are actually in use. And I do not believe Fusix has that. This is called trim support. And uh, I do not see anything. We could always add it, I suppose. Hmm. I think that we're just going to go with this, with the simple approach. It will do for now. Uh, we Can we keep a count of how many writes have been done? Probably not. Because, again, we need somewhere to put it. Actually, we can put it somewhere. We can put that in the in the metadata. Yeah, okay. This will work for now. We can keep track of the number of writes per logical block. That will give us an idea of the overall load on the system. Uh, that means that we can detect if we're writing too often and stop before uh, the device actually gets destroyed. Uh, the root file system is actually going to be small enough that if you're going to do real work, you'll want to use an external SD card anyway. So, uh, yeah, that, that all sounds fine. So, that sounds like a plan for our translation layer. Um, then we can just put an ordinary Fusix file system into the logical uh, sectors, and it won't care that it's living on a flash device. Uh, the translation layer will seamlessly handle things. There are two things we need to do. Firstly, when the system boots up, we have to go and read every block on the file system and determine uh, which logical block they correspond to. And we will end up with a mapping in memory of uh, logical block to physical block. And it is going to be that way around. Uh, the mapping will need two bytes per uh, block on the file system. Uh, we have 768 physical blocks, which, is, which will therefore correspond to one and a half kilobytes. That should be fine. We've got enough space for that, and we can make more space if we need it. Now, the other thing we need to do is special for the ESP8266 and I will deal with that later. So uh, I have 
disabled the SD card stuff that I did last time, but I haven't actually committed it. So uh, let me just make sure that there aren't any stray files there. Do not seem to be. Uh, so I don't recall adding that. Apparently, I did. Okay. So. Okay, so let's create a file for our flash translation layer and let's add that to the build. Okay. don't want that, but we do want a header file describing what's in it. So our FDL system is going to have as major entry points So this will read a this will read this sector 0 to 6 out of this logical block into uh the buffer this will right in exactly the same way. We are going to have the mapping table, so we're going to def define some constants to describe how big things are. So this is the, the number of blocks in the file system. We have a four megabyte uh, device, one megabyte is code, so that will be uh, One more entry point, which is the initialization routine. So what the initialization routine does is it will walk through the physical blocks, looking at the metadata header of each one, and it will populate this. 
So, the first thing this will want to do is to uh, let me think. Every logical block must map to a physical block, but we also want one spare. And we want our round robin pointer. So that's actually going to be one smaller because we need these the extra spare. So for every block, we want to read the header. Okay, I need to go and define some external entry points. These routines will actually access the underlying raw flash device. We will also need a buffer. Because uh, we're going to want this to uh, move things around with. Uh, the kernel's already got buffers, but I don't think we can use any of them. The, the buffers are used for caching file data. And if we were to ask the kernel for a buffer, and there weren't any buffers available, it would have to evict one. And by evicting one, it might have to write it to disk, which means it would need to call into the FDL code. And that's never going to work. So I think we actually have to define our own. So what we're going to do is read the first sector of every block. Which is sector 0 into the buffer. We uh, read the, actually we can do better than that. Uh, these values need to be aligned. Hmm, actually, the problem is that uh, because this is a uint eight, an array of uint eight, it may not be correctly aligned. We're going to have to be more, be more. Uh, we're going to have to do things a bit more 
complicatedly. Okay, so Okay, so that will read in the first sector Uh, sector zero is, of course, not the um, so we've got eight sectors per block. The sector numbering, yeah, I think I want the raw flash to use sector numbers from zero to seven, where zero is the metadata sector. For these, it's act, this is actually going to be the logical sector, which is going to be from 0 to 6. Do I want to do it that way around? Or do I? No, I don't, because that will just lead to complications. So minus 1 will read the metadata sector. Uh, we now have the, the logical sector number in there. So if if it is empty, then set the spare block to this. There should only be one of these. Otherwise, Then the we set up the mapping, and just for the purposes of just for the purposes of being robust, we are going to. ensure that we have a complete spanning set. That is, the, uh, the file system contains mappings for every logical block. Okay, so that should be all the code we need to initialize the FTL stuff. And it does seem to build. Uh, we haven't done the raw flash stuff, so uh, it won't actually link. So read a 512 byte logical sector. Now this should be straightforward. We simply uh, map to the appropriate physical block and read. Uh, you see, this is why I wanted the sector numbers to be compatible. The idea is that the block device layer, which we haven't written yet, will do the division by seven and ask for sector zero to six. Okay, writing is going to be more complex. So 
So the first thing we're going to have to do is to evict the block being pointed to by the round robin pointer. Now there are three potential cases here. Our round robin pointer can be pointing at a block that is in use. It can be pointing to the spare. Or it can be pointing to the block that we are currently trying to write to. Now, we've already covered the logic of if it's pointing to an unused block. If it is pointing to, let's just say we're writing to logical block 2, this one. If it is pointing to the spare, then keep pressing the wrong key. Then we don't bother with the eviction because we don't need it. If it is pointing to the current block, then we actually follow the same code path as we did for if it was pointing to the spare. We copy it to the spare and we erase the, the old one. So we only need to do the eviction if uh, it is not pointing at either the spare or the block that we are trying to uh, write to. So we look up our mapping to figure out what the physical block is. If the physical block is the spare or the round robin block, then we wish to copy the updated block into the spare. So for every sector if it's not the one we want to update We want to copy from the current physical block to the spare physical block unless it's the, let's do that the other way around, unless it's the one that actually contains the data that we want to write to at which point we do a raw flash write to spare physical block uh, sector sector and that data so that will copy our updated data we then wish to why did I write logical here? That should be physical. We then want to erase the old block 
Hang on a second, hang on a second. The physical block here cannot be the spare because the spare stores no data. So this is the only case that matters. Uh, we are actually caring about our round robin block, aren't we? Our three cases are if the round robin block is pointing at the uh, the block that we are updating, or if the round robin block is pointing at the spare, there is only one spare, or if the round robin block is pointing at something else entirely. Okay. So if this is pointing at the spare, or it's pointing at the sector that we are at, uh, the block that we are actually updating, then copy from the current block to the spare, erase the current block. The spare becomes the um, the old physical block. We also need to update the metadata. So uh, which we do with that, and that should be done. So if the case where the round robin block is actually pointing at something else, then we wish to evict the round robin block into the spare and then follow the same logic actually. Okay, so if the, let's invert this conditional, if the round robin block is not the spare physical block and the round robin block is not the the actual physical block then we want to evict the contents of the round robin block we move that into the spare so So from the round robin block into the spare, that sector. And we want to copy the metadata as well, so we do that. Uh, we then erase the round robin block. and the spare becomes the round robin block. Okay. And then we follow this logic. We can do this to copy our actual data from the physical block, which we know cannot be the round robin block. Well, we don't care actually. Uh, from the, we copy data from the current block to the, to the spare. We erase the old physical block 
the spare becomes the old physical block. And we want to increment the round robin block. Okay, so we have an undefined reference to mod SI3, that's in the ROM, uh, which I forgot to pull up. It's here in GitHub. Ah, uh, that's why I couldn't find it. Mod SI3. This is signed modulus. It's not there. Intriguing. Uh, well, there's actually a simpler way around that, which is to just use unsigns for these. Which we probably wanted to do anyway for those. Uh, but we don't want to do for these because we need the negative number. And we don't want to do these because we need that. But it should work for Which round robin block is is an int. Okay. Right, now we need to actually implement our raw flash. These are the routines that actually talk to the uh the real flash device. So add that to the build list. Flash arrays e32 physical write and read. Now This is undefined reference to co oh yeah, I haven't done that. Uh, copy physical sector is a simple helper. All this does is read from source uh, and write to the destination. Very simple. Uh, 
Um, a printf to h. printf h okay now the problem with touching the internal flash is that we are running code from it and we cannot access it while we are running code so what we have to do is we need to disable the flash memory mapping do the work then re-enable it again afterwards that's relatively straightforward. The code to do it is hash read disable turn off the flash uh, afterwards we're going to turn it back on again and then here we need to call uh, SPI, hang on, just look at some code that someone else wrote that does this. Uh, no, hang on, I want to look at this bit of code. So, SPI unlock, SPI arrays, we don't want to erase a block. So I've been talking about blocks and sectors, uh, where a block is 4K and a sector is 512K, because that's what it looks like from inside physics. However, in actual flash terminology, a sector is a small erasable unit, which is what I'm calling a 4K block. And the block is a large erasable unit, which is 64K. So we actually want to erase And we want to start at one megabyte, so that's 10 to 4 by 10 to 4 divided by 4096, 256 4K sectors per megabyte. Okay, uh, and there is actually one more bit of work we need to do because we need to do the equivalent of this, or actually. Uh, IRQ flags because this is what our code will look roughly like. And we actually need to add SPI unlock is at 4878. SPI arrays sector is at 4A00. We're also going to want SPI right, which is at 4A4C. And SPI read uh, 
which is at 4b1c. Okay. So that is actually linked into a kernel. Unfortunately, this is where things start getting complicated. We can't put this routine in the flash because as soon as we call cache read disable, this routine will become un inaccessible. We have to put it into uh, our precious instruction RAM. So let us see how big this is. Right, here is our arrays routine. Not particularly large. Uh, C64, C18, 76 bytes. Yeah, that's okay, I suppose. Uh, we can't use DI because DI is in the main kernel, so we will actually want to inline assembly that uh or will we because it occurs to me that this would be a good opportunity to It would have been a good opportunity to turn DI, IRQ Restore, and EI into macros, which can be inlined. Uh, yeah, we can do that, but we have to, we have to modify the kernel a bit. config okay so we should be seeing yep these are not defined anywhere so we are going to define macros for turning interrupt on and off in the cpu.h file. Uh, and we're going to steal these from the Arduino with modifications. Okay, so this is the core of it. Which is a little chunk of inline assembly I uh, users This is dumb. I'm going to do it like this. Ah, no, I can't do it like that. It has to be a macro. So what this does is when you call the macro, it will inline an arsenal instruction which 
turns interrupts on or off and returns the old state. So I can do a di, uh, that's, in, that's in low level, a di sets the interrupt status to 15 and returns the value. A di sets the state to 0 and returns the value. Now, irq restore is a bit more complicated because we need to write to the uh, ps register uh, there will be a macro for doing this. WSR, WSRPS is the one we want. So this should inline everything we need, assuming it's done right. Let me just do a clean and a build. Okay, what's wrong here? That wants to be PS. find stringify stringify is a nasty macro which turns its parameter into a constant string uh, it works due to weird quirks in the way the C macro preprocessor operates which are weird okay that looked better. Don't see any warnings much. So let's take a look at our disassembly. So the advantage here is that this is going to actually make the code throughout smaller. And more importantly, we calling di is no longer calling out to anything. So you can see here, this has turned into a single instruction. We can actually probably hand tool these to make them smaller, but I think this will do. Uh, here is our IRQ restore, which writes the value back to PS. So how big is our routine now? Sixty five bytes. Okay, that'll do, I suppose. I'll do want to go here to the low level routine and just chop these out because you don't need them anymore. Uh, and we want to go back to raw flash and do the other routines, which are going to look extremely similar. Rather than a raised sector, we're going to be calling SPI write, which takes a byte offset to the um, to the address. So that is block number.
So that gives us the address of the block plus the sector Uh, offset, the SPI flash, buffer, and count. We'll have to put some prototypes for these in because you don't get them by default. Buffer and the length. And it's exactly the same thing down here. Okay, we don't get that there. Do we get it in the Arduino source? No. That makes me a little bit suspicious. Can I actually use these... Uh, in ordinary code? I believe so. Don't see any reason why not. It's not doing anything particularly complicated. 42AC here is actually doing the work. Well, we can always try it and see. So, SPI read address buffer length I should really I should really create a header for all these which I shall actually do now. These were all painstakingly reverse engineered. So they don't really have standard APIs. Where was I? I was in boot.c. SPI unlock and array sector. Oh, uh, and put these in here as well. SPI unlock. Don't know what that does. Array sector. Which takes a sector number. This is a 4K sector number. Okay. I'll actually go look up SPI unlock in the disassembly. See if there are any useful comments. No. All right, so let's take a look at the disassembly. 
Oops. Okay. So raw flash arrays, raw flash write, of which there is kind of an annoying lot of raw flash read. We cannot put these here. We've got to put them in instruction RAM. So we're going to have to shave a bit off the top of our user code. put it in. And we're looking for yeah, this. No, we don't. So we already have a special block here for the uh, the code that gets loaded by the bootloader, the stuff that goes here in boot.c, which initializes the SBI flash. So we're just going to duplicate this, but put it into the other end of things. This goes into iram not not seg, which goes into uh, I need to understand these stupid p headers. I think I think we have zero and one, so Bootloader code goes there. No, hang on. Yes, bootloader code goes here. I ram one zero p header. See so what I ram zero zero. While this goes into I ram one. Okay, let's see what this does when we try and compile it. Uh, region IRAM10 overflowed by 27 bytes. It needs to be bigger. Okay, right, now let's look at our disassembly. I need a new mouse. The left mouse button doesn't stay down all the time. So here is our FTL write routine, which is doing its work. Uh, copy physical sector, raw flash read, raw. Notice the address is here, 4021, indicating that it's in the SPI flash. Raw flash read is at 4010 FEBC, that's in the instruction RAM. That is correct. So this code's, this block of code starts at FE00 and goes on to the end. Now, I believe that the bootloader will initialize this for us. That is, copy it out of the flash. But we're going to check that here in main. We're going to just do if 
40100 FEOO, I believe is the address. 4010 FEOO, okay. Uh, ESP tool which, which takes the ELF file and generates the stuff that we need to burn appears to be happy. Let me just, just see how many output files it's made. Still two, which is good. Um, and we're going to say we're going to do that. And we also don't need this anymore. Okay, so let's burn it and see what it does. We'll see what it says. Looked okay. I do wonder what is in that this file. So this this is the this is what gets actually burnt into the flash at zero. So it's got a header at the top. Uh, then it's got the code, which lives here ish. I'm a bit surprised by these strings. Why are they there? Oh, that's uh. So it's this bit of code here. I'm still surprised by the strings, which shouldn't be there. Okay, well, anyway, let's see what it does. And hit the reset button. Um... Percent P equals O O O O. That seems wrong. Let's take a look at that disassembly. Yeah. It should be this. It's part of the literal table for the the code here. Hmm. So what this is what this means is that the the ESP tool command I believe has ignored that particular uh, section and hasn't written it to the right place, which is annoying. Wonder if I can get this to produce any additional. Tracing. Seems not. But I am still curious about the about the contents of this. So let's take another look at we are looking at the disassembly. 
So, uh, the actual information about what to write will appear after the headers. So if we search for 4081FF3F, we find that here indicating that this in the file is where the this piece of code starts. So that goes down to this FOOD. There's not a lot of this to be honest. O ODFO. Yeah, here we go. Uh, one two C one one O. It's just this instruction. F O O D. Although this is actually a very common suffix in uh, LX one O six code, so it'll appear all over the place. Okay, so let's look for this. F O four seven O O four O. Now it's here. Seven eight four eight zero four zero. Yeah. Oh, yep. That actually looks like this bit of code. So that does kind of look like it's uh, this iram one dot text is in the uh, the binary. I wonder is this wrong? Let's try that. And hit the reset button, as well as knocking stuff off the table. Well, those are all zeros. Has it not actually loaded it into the right place? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, let's actually try looking, you know, put it in the right place in memory. I'll give that another go. Okay, we've got stuff now. I'm going to update the disassembly, hit reset. And what are we seeing? Uh, 8140. Wait, right, these are 16-bit values. Hmm, that doesn't look right. Uh, normally I like it when a mistake turns out to be me doing something really stupid because that turns out to be very easy to fix. But it'd be nice if it happened less often. Okay, flash. Hit the reset button. What are we seeing? F four seven F zero. Four seven F zero. Four eight seven eight. Four eight seven eight. Okay, this is in the right place. For some reason, the Fusix K printf is only printing thirty two bit hex numbers. This is very much intended for sixteen bit systems. 
but this does seem to imply that the code is now in the right place, which is good. We can call it now. So we are going to just stick this in and see what happens. I mean, we haven't actually written a file system there, so it will probably go horribly wrong. It did something. Oh, and it failed. Uh, let's try that again. Okay, this is actually now calling FTL in it. Uh, it's just taking a while. So, where is our FTL code? I'm just going to. As the contents of the buffer is going to be garbage. I'm not going to actually populate the map because if this turns out to be out of bounds it will screw all over memory and I'm just going to do this because we should be able to see it read stuff Okay, that looks good. It ain't the quickest. Yeah, okay. So that's read everything. Uh, has hit the end. Spotted that it hasn't actually read anything and has given up. Good. We do actually appear to have... Uh, we have successfully read stuff from the flash, and the fact that we've got different numbers here indicates it might be working. Our FDL logic looks more or less plausible. Uh, the fact that there's this stuff at the end suggests that there's data at the end of the flash that we might not want to overwrite. So... I think we should be good. All right, so let's have another look at ESP tool. What have we got here? We've got arrays. Ah, right. We can I should be able to just say this. Okay, we can't erase everything. But I can do raise region from five megabytes for three megabytes. Doesn't support a raise region, really? How am I supposed to erase stuff? Apparently, assume that I just have to write stuff. Oh well. So I believe the next thing for me to do is to uh, create a file system and write it. I think for the purposes of testing, let's make a one megabyte flash file system and of course we can only use seven eighths of that so that's 256 physical blocks 3.5k per physical block gives us 896k uh, so uh, 
8.96k. Right, so this is our logical file system, which is currently empty. We're going to create a, a new partition. This is going to be for the swap. Uh, we've got 16, I think 16 processors of 80k each. Uh, let me actually look at my real calculator. Um, let me see, 64k of user plus 32k of code is 96k per process, which is 1440k, 1.4 megabytes, which is bigger than our partition. So let us just actually just make one big partition for now. There we go. And write it. Uh, and make a Fusix file system using one of the Fusix tools. Which should be in standalone. Have I built these? Yeah, we've got MuckFS. Uh, Standalone look FS uh, I need to Hmm, I don't actually know what numbers to give it, to be honest. to see if I if I can see any references sixteen five one two that looks like a number and in fact this is going to erase the partition table I just put on yeah that's fine Okay. Here is our file system. So let's write that to the flash. At address one megabyte file system dot image. And this will probably take a while. Wow, that's slow. That's a long while. Okay, well, let's go up to our config. Uh, we wish to change the boot device here from partition 2 to the whole device, which is to 0, because we're not using the partition table anymore. Uh, and clean and build and next we want to we don't want to call FTL init from there we actually want to uh, create a block device which will represent our uh, flash partition so we're just going to copy the the SD card code okay And 
to take a lot of this stuff out. Oh yes, and we also want the uh, the initialization code, which is in dev sd discard, which is this stuff. Again, most of which we're going to lose. So no drive. What do we actually need to do here? Uh, there's stuff here for getting the capacity. Okay, everything from here up goes. So this creates a block device. Give up if it's if there's nothing there. The transfer function actually does the work. The flush command is used for calling sync. Don't know what driver data is. Okay, that's finally finished. This doesn't look like the code here. I think I copied the wrong thing, possibly the SCSI. Anyway, this at least tells us what this is. I think driver data is private for the block device. So we don't need that at all. We do need to give it a number for the, num for the number of logical blocks, which I believe are uh, one kilobyte. Uh -huh. Hmm. It actually occurs to me that I'm doing things in the FTL layer, I'm doing things with five twelve byte sectors, but I think I can probably use uh, LBA blocks. I don't know how big they are. Well, anyway, this gives us the number of blocks on the device. And scan. Oh, uh, put that here. Scan looks for partitions. So that is all we need. Yeah, I copied the SCSI one. Uh, silly me. So that's all we need to add the block device. We now need to add the transfer function. Yes, def sd transfer. So what this does is uh, it looks at various global variables to determine what it's going to do, that is to read or write a block, and it does it. It's not exactly complicated. So f for what we are doing, we want to decide whether we're reading or writing. If we're reading, we are going to do FTL read. We need to get the, uh, the logical block number. 
So, oh, for byte address card, shift LBA to convert to byte address. Nine, right, okay, they're five 12 byte blocks. So, uh, there are So to get the to get the logical block number, we want to divide by seven. To get the sector, we want to modulus by seven. So when reading, we are going to read logical sector and the destination address is uh, well, where is the destination address the destination address is in a different file Do we have something simpler I can look at? Let's try IDE. Okay, here's the transfer function. Dev IDE read data. Also, I've just remembered that I wrote the logical file system onto the flash, which is just wrong. Uh, we need to turn it into a... We, we need to add the metadata, so I'm going to have to write a little program to do that. Where is this? Right, block op address. Like so. If it's not a read, it's a write. Logical sector block op dot adder. And no error handling, so we just do that. Flush uint fast eight t flush cb as a void does does nothing. Okay, what's this not liking? Ah, yes, I did not prototype my... Um, I did not prototype my FTL functions. That's stn int FTL init. Next turn int FTL read int eighty two t logical in the sector uint eight t buffer FTL right const uh, really FTL in it should return the number of blocks in the file system. Uh, yes, actually I'll make it return the number of blocks in the file system. which is going to be in the logical file system. The number of LBA logical sectors in the logical file system. So that's going to be 
slash blocks minus one because we're not counting the spare times seven. Flash. So here in the initialization code, we want to do that's entirely the wrong place. Dev SD discard dot C. Driver data we're going to ignore. Drive LBA count is the one we want. So that's going to be LBA divided by 2 gives us the size in kilobytes. This goes drive LBA count equals LBA. Okay. Uh, it doesn't like transfer CB. Transfer CB. Doesn't like... All right, this wants to be int. Okay. Now, what are we missing? We are missing a working file system. So let's create a tool to generate a working file system. This is not a kernel file. Okay, right, the make file is set up to build this for us. So Okay, so input file, uh, open. Okay, so the first for for each eight uh, for each seven sector block, we need to write out the metadata. If we do that, we'll get a zero initialized array. Uh, so the metadata is going to be zero for the arrays count, which we haven't actually done anything with yet. And the block number goes in the next two bytes in little Indian order. So okay, and now we write it. Uh, 
Now we read in the seven sectors and write them out again. simple as you can possibly get. So, platform ESP, blah, blah, MOOC FTL, file system dot image to file system dot FTL, file system dot FTL is one megabyte, which is exactly the number we wanted. Uh, we've actually forgotten one important bit. Anyway, here is FTL block zero. Uh, so we've got seven sectors and then here we start the next block, as you can see, it is physical block one. Here is physical block two, etc., down to the end. Right, we actually need to do one extra bit, which is we need We need to write out uh, we need to write out one physical block worth of F of FFs. This will become the spare block. So down the bottom of the file we have, right, that is actually too big because I created the file system the wrong size. Uh, so this did not include the the spare. So that wants to be 892k. Then we can recreate the file system, turn it into FTL. Okay. So here is our spare block right at the end. and we want to write the FTL file, which will take a while. So let's go take a look at our FTL layer. We want to enable this let's put some tracing in Okay, and we want some tracing here, so a printf uh, read and write. Actually, let's put that here.
Okay. So we should now see a line of tracing, or possibly even put semicolon, a backslash there where it's supposed to be for every read and write, and also when the flash initializes. Okay, that's written. Now we burn it and run it and see what happens. And okay, it's reading the correct mapping. Spare is at FF. It has not done anything because I have not uh, initialized it. We actually want to call flash dev in it. Um, hmm, never got round to adding a global header file for the platform. anymore we don't want that anymore and that goes in globals it really it belongs in the kernel proper but it doesn't seem to be there and in main instead of calling FTL in it we actually want to call dev flash in it flash dev in it Okay, we don't need to burn the file system, we just need to update the code. So there is our mapping. Right, what's it done? It has... Okay, well it successfully calculated the size of the file system at 892k. It has tried to read logical sector 0, which is in a logical block 0, sector 0, which is in physical block 0, and has failed. I suspect I am returning the wrong value from our, my transfer function. Yeah, if success, return 1, otherwise we set a error. Let's see what this does. Yeah, it still did not work. Do I need to... Do something with flush? Flush appears to not be being set by the SD stuff, so... Okay, well, let's just not bother with that then. tell it the number of I do need to tell MocFS how big the file system is which is a bit annoying uh, 
and the block size. Do I need a partition table? Uh, it's possible. It's possible I'm using the wrong boot device. So that was documented in start.c here. No, no, I am using the right device. Oh, 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 it's the entire HDA. Do I need to, in here, do I need to set something to tell it how, mu how many bytes have been read? It should just return the entire block. Do not see anything. No, that looks okay. Okay, well, let's take a look at dev MBR. This is the stuff that's parsing a uh, parsing the partition table. So I do not recall it saying that. So we can optimize that actually. Okay, it has said HDA, it's got here, it knows there's a block device. It's now trying to read the partition table, which is not there. So where is it actually? Oh yeah, here it is. It's reading. Okay, I think that's actually working, to be honest. I think it is looking for partition table, fail to find it, and is proceeding to the root file system mount bit. It says it's tried to mount root dev zero read only. And has failed. Okay. So The mount code will be here in start. Here we go, mount root file system. Uh, F mount has failed. This is our root device. So let's go look for F mount. File system C. So this will tell us how far it's getting down through the mount process. Is 
So let's see what this says. Um, there's an optimization we can do in our raw flash code. If the sector is minus one, meaning it's uh, accessing the metadata sector, we don't need to read all 512 bytes. So we can say we can do that. Okay, so we've got to Uh, it got to here, it got to here. It then failed to read the buffer with the super block in it. It also looks like it didn't even bother trying. So... Why was that? Where is B read? Debio. And I think what I'm actually looking for is, oh, hang on. Uh, B find, B find. Bfind looks for a particular block in the cache. And it, uh, physics has a fairly small cache of red buffers, so if, if you try to access a buffer that's already there, then uh, it doesn't bother hitting the disk. Uh, BD read, maybe? Ninety-seven, ninety-nine. BD read failed. So BD read is, I believe, the low-level thing. Right, this calls the block device layer, which is here. which eventually hits here. The fact that it hasn't, uh, we haven't seen any tracing from the flash device, so it hasn't even bothered to try and call it, which suggests that it's um, it thinks something's wrong and isn't actually doing it. Okay, so let's stick our tracing lines in here. Is our drive LBA count wrong? Does it think the device isn't big enough? Well, that's one way to find out. This mount process isn't, fi isn't much faster. Ooh, no tracing. No tracing at all. That means it's not getting this far. So let's remove this in case it's the uh, printing to the serial terminal does take time. So 
So if it's not hitting block dev read, then something here is failing, but there isn't anything to fail. Okay, it's got there. Uh, let's also take the that debug tracing out of main, I think. So oh Remember what I said about stupid problems? Uh, I disabled this config ID, which means there is in fact no block device there. So we want this. Okay, let's give this a try. Scanning flash. Fantastic. So we see all the tracing I put in. Uh, mounting root file system, it has successfully mounted it. It says OK. It has now tried to find the init executable and has failed with this line, panic exec ve, because it has hit here. It is actually trying to load a process off disk load a binary off disk and run it. That's great. It means that we are actually genuinely getting somewhere. Which after yesterday was a bit annoying. And I thought I might not be. So that is... Uh, I think I also need to Io.c. Uh, let's go into our. Actually, I'm going to leave the tracing in the FTL layer because I want it. Uh, did I get that right? Yeah, it's apparently reading and writing one, uh, reading and writing six bytes is not really much faster than the sector. Let's try that again without the tracing. Yep, okay. So this line is it looking at the partition table. This line is it uh, looking at the file system super block. The file system is currently empty, which is why, you know, there's nothing there. All right, that is some good progress for the day. I will commit this Yeah, I can't call it an FTL layer. It's just not allowed. Uh, uh, that FTL file can actually theoretically be moved into the dev directory as a generic FTL system for any other platforms that need it. Uh, that's why I did it in its own uh, file. It would be nice to be a bit smarter. I mean, it is wasting one eighth of the flash. And it also wants to be more configurable. I mean, you saw how long it took to scan the flash on startup. Uh, 
but that's just for a one megabyte partition. Imagine what it'd be like bigger than that. Uh, yeah. There are other ways to do this. Uh, you can stash the, the map in a spare flash block. Uh, that means it will have to move around whenever you update it, just like everything else. This will involve three erasers per operation, unfortunately. Uh, you can delay writing back the map until you know so a little bit of time has passed, or somebody calls flush. That's what flush is for. But you're not really terribly happy with any of that. This is simple and works. So going to call it a day. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments.